Good evening and welcome. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Laila Kamali to deliver the second public event in our formation series. Formations, led by the Postcolonial Studies Centre at NTU and Bonington Gallery, includes talks, workshops, small group creative writing sessions with the Postcolonial Studies Centre's writer in residence, Eve Mackis, book launches, art commissions, conferences, and other events which all aim to invite audiences to engage with the decolonising agenda with Black Lives Matter and Black History Month. In this evening's event, Dr Lila Kamali will deliver a talk which addresses connections between the visual and the textual in the work of John Edgar Wideman, particularly in relationship to the challenge of recording and witnessing histories of African-American communities which go under the radar of mainstream histories. Lila will think about the power of this dialogue with the visual in Weidman's work and what it can mean in the context of the celebration of Black achievement, which Black History Month has come to symbolise. Lila Kamali is a literary scholar with specialisms in African-American literature, Black British literature, diaspora, transnationalism and cultural memory. Her research investigates the relationship between memory, trauma, language and tradition in order to discover ways in which literature resists contemporary forms of racism and builds new forms of citizenship. In addition to her academic work, Lila is also a yoga teacher, body worker and doula for birth support. In all her work, Lila is focused upon building resilience in individuals and communities through explorations of personal and social liberation. You might find it useful to have some practical information about tonight's event. In a moment, I'll hand over to Lila Kamali, who will deliver a talk of around 40 minutes. At the end of Lila's presentation, I'll be able to pose two or three audience questions. So if you would like me to ask a question live online, please send it to me by email using the email address that you'll be able to see at the bottom of the screen, formations at ntu.ac.uk. We'll then invite you to join us for a more informal discussion using the separate link you've received. You can also see this link on the YouTube page in the description below the screen. If you email me, but I don't have time to ask your question online, please do save it for the discussion later. The discussion is also an opportunity for everybody attending to ask questions or offer thoughts and comments and to socialise. We expect the whole event tonight to last around one hour. So now I would like to invite Lila Kamali to talk on John Edgar Wideman, African-American history making and uses of visual art. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, I'll just jump in, jump straight in and start. Uh, so I've got, a, I've got a few slides and the first slide Josh, if you could put that up now. That's just to show um, Weidman's main publication. So you can see that he's really published quite a lot. I won't be commenting on everything tonight, but I am going to do um, a decent, uh, take a look at a decent selection of his works. Uh, tonight's talk will really be um, looking at this theme of visual art in Weidman's work and conducting something of a survey of the function of visual art. Um, so I won't be going into great depth with any one text, um, which makes quite a nice change actually. <laughs> so African-American author John Edgar Wideman is a titan of American and world literature. He has published widely, as you'll see from that list. His books include American Histories, Writing to Save a Life, Philadelphia Fire, Brothers and Keepers, Father Along, Hoop Roots, and Sent Few Yesterday. He's a MacArthur Fellow. He won the Penn Faulkner Award twice and was twice made a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and National Book Award. Born in 1941, the author grew up in Pittsburgh, moving between the poor, largely black neighborhood of Homewood and the more white populated suburb named Shadyside. 
The author's long literary career has been divided into phases. His early work resonates with the voices of the black community in Pittsburgh where he grew up. The culture of African descended peoples in the West whose ancestors were transported on the slave ships. I, this is part of my, um, the foundation for my argument in tonight's talk, is strongly rooted in practices of spirit possession. Both in formal ways, such as the religion de developed in Haiti, known as Vodun, and in church and spiritual practices throughout the Americas, as well as in less formal ways, such as the culture of jazz, where being caught, caught by the spirit is characteristic. The imperative to, to tell stories, to be captured by the spirit it, in the black community he grew up, offers Weidman some kind of, offers, pardon me, the imperative to tell stories and to be captured by the spirit is important in Weidman's work and is something that he gathers from the black community in which he grew up. This imperative arises in Weidman's writing as a result of his own social mobility. Weidman's sense of the particular urgency of telling stories in ways that honor the experiences and the losses of poor disenfranchised communities arises with acute importance from his own personal experience. Weidman's early adulthood quickly began to be typified by opportunity and extraordinary achievement. Coming from those humble roots in Pittsburgh, he gained a, sport, uh, a scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania, played basketball for his state, and went on to become only the second African-American after Alain Locke to be awarded the Rhodes Scholarship by the University of Oxford. In 1976, however, while Weidman was working as a professor at the University of Laramie, Wyoming, he experienced the first of a series of shocks about the significance of his move away from his community when his younger brother Robbie was arrested back in Pittsburgh for first degree murder and armed robbery. Despite the fact that Robbie, now known as Farouk, was not the person holding the gun which resulted in someone being shot, due to a murder, murder felony statute which is now under studied review in the state of Pennsylvania, Robbie was sentenced to, to life in prison. Robbie or Farouk's sentence was commuted last year and he's now out of prison, having spent almost 44 years behind bars. The tragic aspects of Weidman's personal and family life do not end there. In 1986, his own son Jacob was sentenced to life imprisonment for murder after stabbing a classmate on a school camping trip. Jacob remains in prison today. In addressing the continuing preoccupation in his writing with the system of mass incarceration and its relationship to racism, Weidman has mentioned in interview that, quote, our family is deeply mired in corrections. Slavery was a prison and that was a continuity which eventually caught up with me. Weidman's long literary career has been divided into phases. His early work resonates most strongly with the voices of the black community in Pittsburgh, where he grew up. In the first three novels, A Glance Away, published in 1967, Hurry Home in 1970, and The Lynchers in 1973, and it's almost become a commonplace that critics of Weidman's work always remark upon, the stories of the black communities of Pittsburgh are told in a literary style which is founded upon the author's postgraduate training at Oxford, which was in 18th century literature and the rise of the English novel. In the interview I conducted with the author, he said, quote, first three books are just narrative, you know, how you write, Stern, Fanny Burney, the epistolary novel, the rambling structures of Fielding, Clarissa. I was going to school then, I had read probably maybe 25 classic American stories in my life, no more than that. And my thesis was about when the English novel developed. It was quite useful because that knowledge duplicated itself in my work. It gave me a certain kind of skill. Then later I began to extrapolate from that tradition into one based in orality and Africa and the Caribbean and slavery. And that gave me access to another kind of voice." End quote. 
Weidman's mid and later phase work, I want to argue today, throws into question the efficacy of any practice of capturing the black historical past, particularly in the context of a society where the white gaze operates at the center of various forms of knowledge. Weidman mentions in his 1987 novel, Reuben, that Negro History Week is, quote, a celebration, but that black history itself is also sad. This apparently simple observation deepens in complexity in this and subsequent works, which turn to visual artists ranging from photographer Edward Muybridge in Reuben to sculptor Alberto Giacometti in, in the novel Two Cities, to filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard in Fanon, another novel, in order to reflect on the difficulty of ordering a worldview which includes black people and black culture at the center of, the so of society rather than at the margins, and questioning how that is possible when knowledge itself is habitually organized through a white gaze. In the interview I conducted with the author last year, he said that when he began writing fiction in his 20s, towards the end of his time as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, he said the following. I was just putzing around, writing about being like down and out in London and Paris. It was towards the end of my time there that I started to write about growing up in Homewood. I forget which Don, but somebody. I went to one of my teachers there at Oxford and I said, I want to do some fiction writing. Maybe it was John Buxton, because John Buxton was himself a novelist. Anyway, somebody there read my work and said, get closer to home, which was beautiful advice and it made me livid. I didn't want to write as a black American. I wanted to write about Paris and write about London. I wanted to be an eternal figure. And why does he think I have to write about growing up in Pittsburgh? Eventually, though, I became very grateful. I could eventually look at my work and see that some of it was just words and some of it was bringing up subjects and people that I was connected to and I had a stake in. And that was very, very special." End quote. Weidman's literary works, which span more than five decades, draw in detail a Homewood community rooted in the 1950s of his childhood. Particularly in his fourth, fifth and sixth volumes, Dambala, published in 1981, Hiding Place, also in 81, and Sent For You Yesterday, 1983, which were reissued in 1984 as a trilogy named The Homewood Books, Weidman works to recapture what he calls, quote, the storytelling and whiskey all night after we buried my grandmother. My Aunt May tucked back into an overstuffed chair so that her stockinged feet barely touched the rug told us the stories of Homewood. The voices of my people in a circle are menning and laughing and filling in what I didn't know. In the preface to the Homewood books, the author writes, it became clear to me on those nights in Pittsburgh in 1973 that I needn't look any further than the place I was born and the people who'd loved me to find what was significant and lasting in literature. My university training had both thwarted and prepared this understanding and the tension of multiple traditions, European and African-American, the academy and the street animates these texts." End quote. The Homewood books taken together then, it's my understanding, tell many of the fables of Homewood stories which were told largely conversationally between women as they did the work of keeping homes and raising children, and which a keen-eared John Edgar Wideman as a boy absorbed like a sponge. The author is always very assiduous in emphasizing that his work is a continual blending of memories and imagination, and that it enters often seamlessly into multiple times and places at once, so that it would be a mistake to imagine that every story recorded in the author's Homewood work actually happened in Homewood, though taken together, his stories can be understood to be a memorial to that older Homewood community, which is now in many ways lost. A tightly knit community which people, in which people depended on themselves and each other, where racial inequity was very real, but it was a time prior to the more extreme ends of 
violence of gun crime, illegal drugs and police brutality, which have systematically torn US black communities apart in the decades from the 1980s onward. Having put into place foundational work in the capturing of the Homeward Voice in the Homeward Books, Weidman's next book is also probably one of his best known. Brothers and Keepers was published in 1984 and is a memoir written in two voices, that of the author himself and also the voice of his brother Robbie, who he collaborated with on regular visits to the prison to produce the book. Brothers and Keepers was written with some sense of a desire to explain how a life lived in a poor black community can turn a young person to crime and to getting in trouble in the absence of other routes to career success or personal validation. It was published then in some hopes that it would support a case for leniency toward Robert Weidman's sentence. The author writes in the much later work Fanon, Quote, almost 30 years ago, I tried to write a book I hoped might free my brother from a life sentence in the penitentiary. It didn't work. Everything written after that book worked even less, end quote. Robert, now known as Farouk, spent almost 44 years in prison for his part in a botched robbery where a man was killed, but not by him. I believe Weidman's stories of Homeward can be an inspiration to black communities today and to all of us in understanding truly the difference that is made to the life of a place and to the lives of individuals when they have community stories which mean something. Toni Morrison wrote in her 1977 novel Song of Solomon of the importance of names that had meaning. People's stories and names were explicitly torn from them with the system of racial slavery and people continue to be divided from the stories which help them to understand who they are by violent economic inequities and the system of slavery by another name, which is represented by the system of mass incarceration and the, and the prison industrial complex in the United States. Having spent some time now speaking about the enthusiasm with which the author dived into the stories of Homeward and its, and its language, producing three volumes of work in two years, which stand as a testament to that culture and to a lost, in many ways, lost time and place. I'd like now to turn to the ways in which Weidman's mid and later phase work throws into question the efficacy of any practice of capturing the black historical past, particularly in the context of what is recognized as a white centered society. Black History Month itself is commonly framed as a time of telling the stories which have been left out of history. And I want to show this evening how Weidman uses visual art perspectives in his later work in order to express a kind of skepticism about the exercise of knowing black history, knowing black community by the practice of observing it. Observation is of course the foundation of the visual and it's also the foundation upon which many different kinds of knowledge, scientific, sociological, historical, are built. We cannot escape the fact that observation has also historically formed a key part of the way in which colonial empires and their cultures have dominated the world. It remains true today that the dominant historical gaze of the mainstream tends to be one whose interests are weighted toward the powerful white center and which erases any kinds of truth about black people's experiences, which is not filtered through a white gaze. Now we could argue about whether that process of knowing by observation is what happens in Black History Month or not, and I'd encourage discussion about that afterwards. Weidman prefaces uh, his 1981 short story collection, Dambala, with the following from Maya Deren's divine horsemen, the voodoo gods of Haiti. Quote, Dambala Wedo is the ancient, the venerable father, the great father of whom one asks nothing save his blessing. Dambala is himself unchanged by life and so is at once the ancient past and the assurance of the future. Associated with Dambala are divinities. To invoke them today is to stretch one's hand back 
to that time and to gather up all history into a solid contemporary ground beneath one's feet." End quote. Key here in this process is the fact that to know history in this more African-centered cultural mode is to appeal first to an ancient God who is situated in the past as well as in the present and the future. Marguerite Fernandez Olmos and Elizabeth Parabasini Gebert explain that Vodun, also known as Voodoo, Vodou, Vodun, is, quote, the oldest, least understood, and perhaps most maligned of all Afro Caribbean belief systems, born in the Dahomedan, Congolese, and Nigerian regions of West Africa, and filtered through Roman Catholic symbolism and liturgical traditions. End quote. Vodun's hybrid forms in the Americas have served to connect disparate realms and to situate the over there of Africa with the here and now of the Americas. Crucially, Vodun is a system of religious practice which includes spirit possession and in which, therefore, the subjective gaze toward history situated by a person's eyes in what we in the West customarily think of the present must always be considered to be far less significant in shaping experience than is that dialogic and somewhat, mis somewhat mystical relationship with God's spirits and ancestors. At this point then, it might be useful to ask how Black History Month as an idea relates to this use that Weidman makes of an African-centered cosmology. And I'm grateful to Jenny for the prompt to think about this because it led me to some interesting things in the texts. First, some more tangible history of Black History Month itself. African-American scholar Carter G. Woodson created Negro History Week in 1926 with his Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. The month of February was chosen in the United States because that was the birth month of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick, Frederick Douglass, two inspirational figures for African-American communities. Woodson had begun to push for expanding the week into a month by 1950 when he died suddenly of a heart attack. The mantle was taken up by a younger generation in the moment of the Black Power Movement. Black History Month was first proposed by Black educators and the Black United students at Kent State University in February 1969. The first celebration of Black History Month took place the following year at Kent State in 1970. Six years later, Black History Month was being celebrated all across the United States in educational institutions and centres of Black culture. Here in the UK, of course, Black History Month is not in February, but in October. It was first celebrated here in October 1987 and was organised through the leadership of Ghanaian analyst Akiaba Adai Sebo, who came to Britain as a political refugee and served as a coordinator of special projects for the Greater London Council, the GLC. Adai Sebo expressed concern about black school children internalizing negative and racist stereotypes in schools that he'd visited in London. And October was chosen as the moment in the year when children were considered most receptive to learning as a time to focus on black culture and achievement. Weidman mentions in his 1987 novel, Reuben, that Negro History Week is a celebration but that black history itself is also sad. This apparently simple observation can be interpreted, I want to suggest, as having a particular depth in the way that it contrasts the notion of celebration of black achievement, survival, and so on, with another kind of discourse which takes more seriously the work of situating black experience in a black-centered worldview. True to the philosophies of African-American th thinker W.B. Du Bois and the Martinican uh, psychiatrist Franz Fanon, whose ideas have been so key to decolonial agendas, the visual, the gaze and the act of looking holds a definitional importance 
which underpins an understanding of race and racism in the 20th century, and today in the 21st, remains searingly relevant. Du Bois wrote in 1903 this statement, which to my mind will remain eternally relevant as long as racism continues to plague us. Quote, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder." End quote. According to T. Owens Moore, while, quote, Fanon's theme was very similar to Du Bois' thoughts, there is little to no documented evidence that links the intellectual careers of Du Bois and Fanon. Nevertheless, Fanon wrote in, in 1952 in Black Skin, White Masks of a similar experience of being looked at by white people, even by children, in his experience in France. Quote, the occasion arose when I had to meet the white man's eyes. An unfamiliar weight burdened me. Look, a Negro, mama, a Negro. My body was given back to me, sprawled out, distorted, recolored, clad in mourning in that white winter day. Astonishing quote. <laughs> in the novel Reuben, one of the characters, Kwanzaa, raises the idea of Negro History Week alongside the, ne the notion of celebration and, and seems to point to a worldview which is utterly inadequate in the face of the demand made by the ghosts of history to acknowledge and to do some form of justice to the brutal economy which commodified humans as part of the system of racial slavery. That same system which continues to do too little to overturn the structures which accept racial, racial inequality as a fitting backdrop to individual achievement. Here's the quote from the novel, Reuben, in which, in, interestingly enough, there's also an allusion to seeing the visual and not being able to see, quote. And um, Weidman's quoting from Robert Hayden's poem, The Middle Passage here. The dark ships move, the dark ships move. At the homeward branch of Carnegie Public Library, they were saying poems. One about slavery days and slaves carried across the ocean in sailing ships, sharks eating the poor Africans they throwed overboard. Negro History Week, a celebration. But that poem was sad, sad. A boy in sunglasses saying it by heart. Kwanzaa had been amazed he could remember all the words. Somebody said later he was blind, blind as a bat behind those, dark, those black glasses could have had seven books in front of him and wouldn't do him no good if he, fo if he forgot the words. The dark ships move, the dark ships move. The strong backs of the men, their hunched shoulders as they covered her, driving themselves into her. They were dark ships, dark ships and she was the storm, the wind beneath their wings, the sea rocking them, the shore they'd never reach. With the citation of the Robert Hayden poem, Middle Passage, originally written, written in the 1940s, Weidman's conflation of dark ships with the strong backs of the men, suggesting oarsmen or slaves, is also wedded here with the ordinary urban setting of the homeward branch of the Carnegie Public Library, which is still a functioning library in the, in the heart of the homeward community today. The dark ships, the strong backs, in the everyday setting in which the novel's character Kwanzaa lives, where she must sell her body to live and to feed her child, morphs into, quote, he rolls up off you and if he ain't no fool, he knows you can't live on air, your baby can't live on air, so if he be a decent man, he leaves something, end quote. Bodies thrown overboard, bodies sold in order for children to have a chance to live, the truth of life in America and the history of black people's existence in America is unspeakable. 
and to raise the possibility that Black History Month does in a way of celebration in a wider context for which sad is a remarkable understatement, points bitterly to the sentiment unveiled in Hayden's poem from which Weidman is quoting. And this is, so this is from Hayden's poem. Shuttles in the rocking loom of history, the dark ships move, the dark ships move. Their bright ironical names, like jests of kindness on a murderer's mouth. We could take that last line of Hayden's jests of kindness on a murderer's mouth as a powerful indictment as to the way that Black History Month could be read, and this is up for discussion. After all, as long as we live in a society which is structured by inequality of racial and other forms, where babies go undernourished in the wealthiest cities in the world, it's fair to consider that Black history as a celebration could be seen in this way jests of kindness on a murderer's mouth. As we move forward from that 1987 novel, we find Weidman referencing a further range of visual artists from the early photographer Edward Moybridge, also in Reuben, to sculptor Alberto Giacometti in Two Cities, the novel published in 1998, to filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard in Fanon, the other novel of 2008. In order to reflect on the perennial difficulty of ordering meaning from an ever-changing and multi-voiced world in which racial and social injustice continually defies the sense of an ethics of care and quote, greed always has the deepest, po deepest pocket. In Reuben, the author approaches the figure of Edward Moybridge with some perceptible irritation. And if we could have slide two, please. Moybridge developed the first still photography, which was fast enough to capture images of bodies in action. And this is a quote uh, from, again, from the novel Reuben. Yes, Moybridge had proved his point about a, ga about a galloping horse. All four hooves are airborne simultaneously. You move faster, you traverse the hard earth more efficiently by touching it not at all. You leave it behind you, beneath you, but you don't tell anyone, and no one knows unless they're willing to get down, 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 stoop to the black magic tricks you conjure to win the race. And I think it's fascinating the way there's a, a, a contrasting view of the ground beneath your feet from that quotation about Dambala that we heard earlier, the ground beneath the feet in the, in the African cosmology was to be worshipped. In this uh, more westernized, modern view, it's to be trampled over and to be, walked, to be run over as fast as possible in order to progress and to win the race. The conjure, the magic here, ironically, is that modern Western way of ordering knowledge and ordering the gaze and the, the bleh, the capacity to see in order to dominate, to subject the seen persons, communities to an economy in which there must be dominion, there must be a winner. While the white gaze centers, while black people, black history is known by being looked at, this modern tradition where power is founded upon knowing about the other will always subjugate somebody. The character Reuben, a lawyer in the black community of Homewood notices something different about the way his memories of his community come to him. Quote, lately Ruben's memory had become more like those all night call in radio talk shows, an unpredictable mix of voices coming from everywhere and nowhere, voices with nothing in common, but an 800 number that gave them access to a private space within him, the quiet that seemed like it might rain forever till some prearranged signal opened the lines and the phones began to jingle. Crazy people howling at the moon, thoughtful shy ones who chose words carefully, smart Alex, mental defectives, know-it-alls, neurotics, bullshit artists, voices unspeakably lonely, voices full of themselves or full of that profound emptiness apparent only when people come together in numbers to quell it. Yet no one was in charge, no host, no writer, no master of ceremonies no shared notion of style or propriety among the callers. 
Ruben's memory of his past was just this bizarre, urgent competition for airtime, disembodied souls calling in from the four corners of the universe, end quote. In this alternative economy of receiving memory, the gaze from the subject situated in the present is not in any position of ascendancy over the voices of the past. He is receiving almost like a radio transmitter. A further indictment is made upon the scientific project of Moybridge and the way it captures the keen intent to gaze, to look at, quote, when he puts you in his camera, you are young forever, saved forever as long as someone remains to look. In the excellently titled chapter, The Funky Novels of John Edgar Wideman, where the word funky means smelly as well as speaking to musical forms, Stephen Casimir writes, quote, when Wideman invokes smell, he invokes the subversive, stimulating and awakening power of odor, which gives us access to other worlds and other ways of being. Sense perceptions other than sight intrude upon the novel and are juxtaposed against the presentation of the quintessentially visual efforts of Edward Moybridge to arrest time. End quote. This interest in the other senses besides sight strongly informs the alternative worldview, which Weidman, I'm suggesting, is very keen to populate his work with in order, to, in order that black experience may be understood in its own sensory and experiential terms. In the 1994 novel, Two Cities, set in the two cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, um, and if you could put up slides three and four in their own time, please, Josh, thanks. Weidman uses his photographer protagonist, Martin Mallory, to question the perspectives raised by another visual artist, Alberto Giacometti. Mallory writes letters to the sculptor Giacometti and asks, how can I make photos that invite a viewer to stroll around them as they might stroll around one of your tall, tiny women on her pedestal? If I ever get good, my pictures will remind people to keep a world alive around them to keep themselves alive at the center of a storm of swirling emptiness, end quote. Referring to Giacometti in one of the stories in his short story collection, God's Gym, the author suggests, I could sense Giacometti didn't trust what was in front of his eyes. He felt the strangeness, the menace. He understood art always failed. Art lied to him. People's eyes lied. No one ever sees the world as it is. I consigned myself just as Giacometti numbered himself among the blind, end quote. If art itself then is a process of looking and of defining through the gaze itself, it's, it's also a more reflexive exercise than the practice of Western history, which shapes the idea of Black History Month. Art then in this in instance questions the authority of its own gaze, questions the practice of viewing, questions that, that practice of seeing in any way of extrapolating meaning by looking at the other. Asking at one point, and if we can go to slide five now, please. Did you know you were sculpting Africans, Mr. G Giacometti? The author eventually brings the Italian artist into di dialogue with Romari Bearden, the collage artist who went to Weidman's own high school in Pittsburgh. Martin Mallory asks, quote, Dear Mr. G, have you seen the paintings of Mr. Romari Bearden? He's my fellow countryman and I'm proud to say of African descent as I am. I'm curious about your familiarity with Mr. Bearden because his art shares much with yours. His paintings are many paintings in one, overlapping, hiding and revealing each other. Many scenes occur at once, a crowd hides in a single body, like a choir singing. Each voice distinct, but also changing the sound of the whole, changing itself as it joins other voices. In the piano solos of Mr. Thelonious Monk, I hear familiar tunes drifting in and out, hiding and uncovering each other, old songs playing something new, music no one's ever heard before, end quote. 
Martin Mallory, the character in Two Cities, asks, what is your first language, Mr. G? And then talks about a first language as, quote, I love this quote, the language in which you learn to feel, a body language of smells, noises, colours, movements of the first people who care for you when you're helpless, who teach you to crawl, walk, talk, who hold you and smile at you and feed you and clean you. And if you're lucky and loved, sing to you, rock you, tuck you into the warmth of their bodies so you forget you are not them and they are not you. A first language of feelings without names, many feelings inside each word you learn, end quote. Including black people in a world view is not about looking at them. It is about being in their language, a way of being in their experience. Fanon knew this when he wrote, look mama, a Negro. And Weidman writes back to Fanon implicitly, I would argue, throughout his corpus, finally coming out explicitly ab about this with his 2008 work entitled, you guessed it, Fanon. <laughs> Weidman writes, discovering more about Fanon as I continue this project of writing a life, it becomes clear that Fanon is not about stepping back, standing apart, analysing and instructing others, but about identifying with others, plunging into the vexing, mysterious otherness of them, taking risks of heart and mind, falling head over heels in love, whether or not there's a chance in the world love will be required or redeemed. At least I think that's what my mother understands about Franz Fanon what she shares with him, something like that anyway, expressed in her own words, in the actions of her life, end quote. Collage, a visual art form for certain, appeals to Weidman. And if we could have slide six, please. And how ironic that it comes from an artist so close to home for him. Again, in Fanon, Weidman also mentions Romari Bearden, the world famous painter who attended Peabody, the same high school in Pittsburgh, my incarcerated brother and I attended. And comments, Romari Bearden's collages remind me of how my mother, another one of my idols, a lifesaver like Fanon, talks. Her stories flatten and fatten perspective. She crams everything, everyone, everywhere into the present, into words that flow, intimate and immediate as the images of a beard and painting. Makes the moment present and large enough, thank goodness, to include everybody listening. Bearden's collages and my mother's narratives, truly democratic, end quote. In the 2018 collection American Histories, uh, slide eight, slide uh, eight, please. Yeah, the author Bearden, the author brings Bearden up again and situates him in dialogue with the American artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, who was of Haitian and Puerto Rican descent and died young of a drug overdose. Weidman situates Bearden and Basquiat as being artists who recognize the value of disordered forms such as collage in representing the democratic power of African-American voices. The powerfully brutal implications of the white gaze and its ordering of history in order to construct meanings which support unequal power structures culminate in the 2000 novel, 2016 book, writing to save a life, which shows painstakingly how the historical archive was willfully misshaped in order, to, in order to perpetuate white supremacist power structures by exonerating the killers of Emmett Till and implying his father Lewis Till's criminality. The book's work follows from Weidman having applied for and obtained a copy of the Lewis Till file, the documentary record from the US government's National Archives, the file which apparently tells a story of Lewis Till's guilt. However, and this forms the crux of the matter for Weidman's investigation, which stands as an important revision in its own right of the historical record, even as it's blended with fiction and memoir in this work which, which straddles genre. 
The Lewis Till file was previously extracted from the archives in 1955, tampered with and used as part of a specific representation of the criminality of Emmett Till's father, which was used to exonerate Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam of the kidnapping, torture and violent murder of the teenager. Even apart from this calculated exhumation of the file in order to, in effect, to convict Emmett Till and reconvict his father, writing to save a life shows how the historical record also bears the trace of willful cuts and distortions of the truth, probably made in 1945 in order to expedite the conclusion of a messy case by hanging two men of whom Lewis Till was one, who may or may not have been guilty, as part of the national effort to accelerate the end of the Second World War. In reading the account compiled by criminal investigation division agents of testimonies given as part of Till's court martial process, Weidman writes that, quote, spoken words have been reduced to typed summaries, translation, conversion, reduction. There are, quote, three repetitions or more of more or less the same story asserting violent details of who did what to whom. So Lewis Till was um, accused of raping and murdering um, some women in, in Italy where he was serving during the Second World War. Weidman's description of the fractured, fragmented and disordered historical account features uncanny repetition of the same details which can seem to speak of truth but which are also likely to speak of fabrication or manipulation in the service of a convenient and racially biased version of events. Turning to visual art here again proves instructive as, he can, as the author considers some glass sculptures, which I believe are those of Antoine Le Perlier. And if we could go to the last slide, please. In Paris, Antoine had shown me slides of his new work on exhibit in Nice. Transparent cubes, globes, chunks of glass with all sorts of unpredictable things displayed inside. Things which seemed to both swim and be frozen. The best of the new pieces continued an investigation of time. All life sealed in glass and glass itself sealed within a sheath of uncertainties. Glass complicit with time, yet not quite able to alter or evade it. Lives encased in glass, doomed to repeat and suffer history. And that's from Writing to Save a Life. It's my last, last bit now. Glass cubes here serve as a metaphor for the Western construct of linear time, which places the present in ascendancy over the past and the power of the gaze often a white one, over those who are seen and constructed by that gaze. As is shown so meticulously in this recent book from this formidable author, the power to shape times and events, time and events at will, is a concrete part of white supremacist power and has material effects in the world. That the power of that white gaze is what exonerated completely the white men who tortured, brutalized, and murdered a child, Emmett Till, for being black. In a strange way, Emmett Till haunts all of John Edgar Wideman's work. They were born in the same year, 1941, and while history looked at Emmett Till in a way that cost him his life and his childhood innocence, Wideman today remains committed to the importance of dismantling the visual as a field in which knowledge is constructed. And that's it. Thank you so much for that, Lila. That was a wonderful um, talk on, on Weidman's work, his kind of history, his life. Um, we've just got a couple of moments for questions now, and then we'll move into the the more informal discussion parts of today. Okay. So I wanted to start um, with a question that's come in anonymously on email, who um, somebody asked whether Weidman's work changes over the years in terms of how it represents 
black history or or how it thinks it can represent black history the change over all those years of writing yeah I mean I think you know there's that in that very well in the first three novels um Weidman is writing in a style which is shaped by his study of the English the 18th century English novel um so I mean he is he is incorporating some African American vernacular, but not to the extent that he later that he, he later does. So he's a you know he's a very young writer at that time, and um, he's you know emulating or he's he's working within a training which has been shaped by you know old English writers and you know he was he got heavily into the study of those writers and. Um, greatly respected their craft, I think. So, so that was the the perspective he was coming coming towards um, African American history from from that kind of unlikely place in a way. And then he had this um, this realization, um, you know, following from going back to Pittsburgh on the occasion of his grandmother's funeral, and realizing that the the real power of um, the literature that he wanted and needed to be writing was contained in, contained in the stories that he'd been hearing all his life and contained in the language he'd been hearing all his life. And um, we see, you know, there's a, there's a few years break between those first three novels and the second three novels. And then the, those second three novels, are, uh, no, two novels and one collection of short stories are published in very rapid succession. So there's then, you know, this true commitment to recording the language of his childhood community, which, um, you know, already at that time of the publication of those works, already the, that community was um, was being assaulted, basically. It was, you know, Homewood turned in that time from being quite a, quite a, um, a wholesome community, poor but wholesome community in a sense, um, to to being completely ravaged by drugs and gun crime and um, violence, um, and that that legacy has has gone on until today. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I've 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 made some suggestion tonight that um, it's in the kind of second half probably of his career where he's he's really shown a great interest in turning to visual art um, and and using visual art as as a, a as a canvas let's say that or as a site where um, there's this this dialogue and this almost a kind of wrestle within his consciousness between a western worldview and an african cosmo cosmo cosmology cosmological worldview um, and I think it's it's really interesting, the um, the perspectives that come up from that, and, and the way that he's able to access African American voice through that use of African cosmology. Definitely, thank you. There was another question from Danny in Nottingham um, who asked what Edgar Wideman is, John Edgar Wideman is like. What's he like as a person? Uh, in reference to your um, comment that you had interviewed Wideman. Um, a year ago and I know that you mentioned to me that you've also interviewed him much more recently than that so perhaps you can talk about your impression yes, of writer. Just I interviewed him again for the second time just last night and um, this was a private event the second time because um, it was it was in connection with Rhodes House at the University of Oxford which is the the, the branch of the university which looks after the Rhodes Scholars and the Rhodes Scholarship is, you know, this uh, veritable institution which has this incredible history of bringing people from all over the world to study at Oxford um, and, you know, still still really running, you know, such rich work today. Um, and so, you know, last night in this discussion, we were able to bring John into dialogue with two young Rhodes Scholars um, younger people who are working on the same kinds of issues which which preoccupy John, you know, racism and mass incarceration. Um, and to answer the question of what's he like, 
I think he's very, I think he's a very nice guy. I, I get on quite well with him. I was super intimidated, you know, when I first had the opportunity to meet him and interview him. Um, and particularly, uh, he, I mean, I don't, I don't know, over the decades that he's been, you know, an author and been in the public eye somewhat, he has um, acquired a reputation of, of being um, difficult to interview or being an author who who puts his guards up. I've, I've read that, you know, on a, a number of occasions over the years. Um, but maybe he's softened. You know, I, I didn't find that um, he he put his guards up with um, with our interview experiences either time. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's 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 such a gift. It's such a privilege to have that personal connection with someone who's whose work you engage with so deeply and admire as well quite strange though because you know when I'm doing the critical work I and now that I know him I, I sort of have to maintain this sense of like okay you know don't lose your critical faculty <laughs> you know you have a personal relationship as well but there's the, the, the two are separate in a way yeah <laughs> Okay, well, that's, I think that's a fascinating note on which to end the formal part of tonight's talk. And we'll, we'll move now into the more informal discussion. So everybody should be able to find the link um, on their Eventbrite invitation, but also online as well. And we will, we will see you there. Um, thanks so much for joining us in a couple of moments. So thank you again, Lila Kamali, for a fascinating talk tonight. Thank, thank you. you. See you in a moment.